Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, Professor Jimmy Lin from the University of Maryland. Uh, Jimmy has been uh, working with us and participating in Google's Academic Cloud Computing Initiative program, and we, he is here to tell us more about it. Thanks very much. All right. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Andrea. Um, so today I'll be talking about my experiences uh, uh, doing research in education in the cloud, sort of uh, um, sharing with you guys what I've been up to over the uh, last couple of years. Okay, so why don't I start off by telling you guys a little bit more about myself. So um, I... Uh, I got my undergrad, uh, master's and PhD, all from MIT. I loved it so much. They uh, I decided to stay there whole time, and they had to actually kick me out. No. Uh, but uh, I worked in the computer science and artificial intelligence laboratory. I finished my PhD in 2004. And, uh, and uh, since then, I've been at the University of Maryland in the information school there. And recently, I was just uh, awarded a uh, promoted to associate professor with tenure. So that's a big milestone in my own career. Um, Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think of my own research as lying at the intersection of NLP, natural language processing, and information retrieval. And uh, for the last couple of years, a lot of my, my work has been in this buzzword, um, worth noting, uh, uh, field of cloud computing. Okay, so how did I start getting involved in this? Um, well, I started involved uh, in the Academic Cloud Computing Initiative. So many of you might recognize uh, Christophe Basilia, who is, I guess, the, the, the brainchild behind this whole program. Uh, this started two years ago, uh, the uh, Google IBM Academic Cloud Computing Initiative with a few pilot institutions. Maryland was among one of them. And uh, we're fortunate enough to, uh, to be invited to participate in this. And I'm uh, basically the lead faculty at Maryland on this. Uh, and uh, more recently, this collaboration has been extended to uh, include the National Science Foundation in, a, uh, in the Cluster Exploratory Research Program. Okay, so um, what, is, what, is this, what, is, what is this all about? Um, so for those of you that hack Perl, this sort of, sort of a one-liner might sort of uh, get a kick out of, right? So the, the idea being, you know, when in doubt, throw more data at it, right? So take a global substitution for, uh, for knowledge and, and throw data at it. Right? And this is something that, uh, that the NLP and the IR community has known for a long time now. So um, this is a, a work that's often cited in the literature by Michelle Benko and uh, Eric Brill in ACL 2001. So over here we have a, uh, uh, the performance graph of a super, uh, supervised machine learning task. On the x-axis we have the amount of data, uh, training data, that you, um, that's thrown at it. And on the y-axis here you have accuracy. I think this is... Uh, this is uh, class uh, grammar, grammar correction. So naturally, you see the more data you throw at it, the better the performance get, holding else, uh, all else equal. Uh, so more recently, there's been work by uh, your colleagues at, in Google Research. So this is, uh, this is uh, Brant et al. from Google Research. And the same idea applied to machine translation. So on the x-axis here, you have uh, the size of the collection you use to train your language models. And the y-axis, this is on a machine translation task, you have the blue score, which is a standard metric for evaluating machine translation performance. Okay, so once again, you see the same trend. Uh, the more data you throw at it, the, uh, the, the better the, uh, the performance gets. Okay, so I've given variants of this talk several times before, and, uh, and this is actually the, 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 the first time I've given it at Google. And so I think that literally here I am preaching to the choir, right? So, so what's interesting here? I mean, what's, what's different about this particular talk? Um, I think what I want to sort of focus on is this part of it. Uh, so if you look at the X scale, that's uh, on the order of trillions of tokens, okay? So um, actually I was just having dinner with uh, one of your colleagues yesterday, and uh, you know, he was remarking, oh, I just go and start up a language modeling server and I can just get access to all of this. But, uh, but the, the problem I want to focus on today is, well, how do we get the rest of the world to that point? How do we get the rest of the world to the point where web scale, uh, web scale uh, processing, natural language processing and information processing is uh, available for the masses? And the, sort of the, the question that goes hand in hand with that is, you know, how do we educate uh, future computer scientists, and this is something that I've given some thought over the last couple of years about. Um, and so I'm going to break this down into two problems uh, that I've sort of recognized, and I'm going to share my experiences on these lines. The first is the prerequisites problem. The second is uh, what I'm calling the, the resource problem. 
and I'll go uh, in them uh, one at a time. Okay, so the prerequisites problem. It's actually fairly simple how you tackle large data problems, right? You apply divide and conquer. This is sort of everything that we learn in CS101, right? You take, uh, there's some amount of work, you divide it into little work units, you uh, send them through each worker, you get intermediate results, and you have to put everything back together again, right? So this is naturally breaks down into a partition problem on the one end and a, com a combination problem on the other end. Okay, but in reality, it's a little bit more complex than that, right? You, in order for get, uh, to get these things to work, you need to, um, this is our, these are the things you need if, to learn if you take a uh, distributed, parallel distributed computing course, right? You learn about things like fundamental issues, right? How to, how to worry about scheduling, data distribution, synchronization, inter-process communication, uh, fault tolerance. You worry about architectural issues, right? Uh, this is where you learn, learn about Flynn's taxonomy, uh, UMA versus NUMA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you learn about different programming models, right? Message passing uh, and uh, shared memory models. Uh, you learn about common problems, and they go by very lively names as you know, dining philosopher, sleeping barbarous, etc. And finally, you learn about various programming constructs to deal with these common problems, right? You learn about barriers, conditional variables, mutexes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you learn about um, uh, about things like a master-slave architecture, presumer, uh, producer, consumer queues, etc. But the upshot of all this is uh, the reality is that the programmer shoulders all the burden of, uh, of managing the concurrency, right, at a, at a very low level, right. So this comes, this creates a problem if you want to teach web scale NLP or IR, right. So. Um, so what are what are the options if you want to teach web scale text processing or information processing? Well, you have a couple options. The alternatives are, one, you sort of don't. Right? You sort of uh, brush aside the topic and say, okay, you know, we'll work on reasonably sized data sets that you can fit on your laptop and everybody goes home happy. But of course, this is not a good solution because this is exactly the problem that the Academic Cloud Computing Initiative was designed to uh, to address in the first place. Okay. The second alternative is you set up a set up pre, uh, a separate prerequisite chain, right? So before you take my web scale uh, text processing course, you go and take a separate course in um, parallel and distributed systems or something like that. But of course, the issue with here is it sets up a uh, a long prerequisite chain, and you're going to lose people along the way. Okay. And the third alternative is well, uh, you you essentially integrate the prerequisites in your own class. Right, so I'm, I would teach a web scale NLP or IR course, and I spend a few weeks teaching everything that the students need to know in order to be able to work at that scale. Of course, the downside here is that while well, you spend half your course teaching them the fundamentals of exactly the things I showed on the, uh, on the previous slides. Okay, so um, the alternatives are we're stuck between a rock and a hard place and another hard place. Right, so I think you can see where this is going, right? So MapReduce is, uh, comes to the rescue here, right? So it allows you an abstraction that allows you to uh, design algorithms at a much higher level of abstraction, right? You write the mapper and reducer and that's it. The runtime handles everything else. Um, and the nice thing about it is now that, now that there is Hadoop, uh, it's really accessible to, to the rest of the world. Right, so Hadoop, uh, implement, uh, open source implementation, MapReduce, um, and uh, instead of Sawzall, there's Pig, sort of the roughly comparable equivalent in the open source world. There's Hive, the data warehousing application from Facebook. So there's a vibrant open source community that's evolving around this. Okay, so uh, by, by using uh, MapReduce Hadoop as the underlying substrate, it allows uh, me as a faculty in a course to focus on uh, teaching NLP and IR algorithms and, and move away from system level details, right? So, so that's sort of a nice solution to the problem number one, the, the prerequisites problem. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, uh, move on and talk about the, uh, the second problem, the resource problem. Okay, so it's been said that with cheap community uh, commodity clusters and simple distributed programming models like MapReduce, you add them together and you have data uh, intensive computing for the masses. Okay, so you should ask me, well, what's the problem here? Well, there's still several problems. One of them is that cheap is relative, right? So we've lowered the bar a little bit, right? Instead of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for to, to play in this game, uh, you now only need tens of thousands of dollars. You know, these numbers are really rough, but you get the idea. You still, you've lowered the bar, but I still don't think it's slow enough. So that's, that's issue number one. The second issue is, um, the difference between research and education. So this is sort of a mismatch between funding models. So uh, in, in, in the university and in academia, hardware resources are for the most part 
pay for by research grants, right? And as such, they should be used for doing research. And so, uh, so in an actuality, all the hardware that we at universities can, uh, can acquire are, are procured in this manner. And so it's a little bit tough to say, um, to turn around and use these cluster resources for teaching. And in fact, very few places do actually have uh, dedicated uh, teaching clusters for doing web scale processing. So that's, that's another issue. Okay. So what are the solutions? So I'm going to talk about three separate solutions. The first is charity, right? Get somebody to give it to you for free. And to that, in that respect, we're fortunate enough to be uh, at Maryland, be part of the uh, cloud computing initiative. So we, we got our, uh, we got some resources for free. The second is, well, what if we could bring research and education more into alignment and thereby leverage, uh, uh, leverage clusters that were purchased under research grants for educational purposes? Okay, so that's an interesting idea that I played with. And the third is the idea of utility computing. Uh, so uh, why not use uh, EC2 or, or some utility computing service to, uh, for teaching purposes? Okay, so what I basically have been doing in the last uh, couple years is exploring these various approaches. So uh, they were operationalized in two separate uh, cloud computing courses, basically uh, Hadoop courses uh, I taught, uh, the first one in spring of 2008 and the second one in fall of uh, 2008, uh, essentially using and trying out these solutions. Now, now here it's, of course, I, I have to recognize that I'm, of course, not the first person to be doing this, and uh, others have been doing this as well. So we um, re recognize excellent work that's been ongoing at the University of Washington, at Berkeley, and a few other places. Berkeley, you mentioned the Red Lab. Yeah, Red Lab. Because mm -hmm. I got huge pushback, and I'm curious to hear what they're saying. When I told them that they should be teaching their ES3 or um, computer engineering in theory, Okay. Well, I have I've haven't heard that feedback before. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, let me give you an overview of these two cloud computing courses. So in spring 2008, uh, I ran. This is the first time I ran it, and I had the explicit goal of well, why don't I uh, integrate research and education? So the basic idea was to put and create together teams, small teams of graduate students. PhD students leading undergraduate students, and the idea is to tackle open research problems, and I wanted them to generate publishable results, and they did. And I'll be presenting a couple case studies from, uh, from these courses. Um, and so for the most part, I encouraged PhD students to choose a problem that they were working on as part of their dissertation and to uh, bring it into my cloud computing course. And that actually worked out quite successfully. So the actual setup is uh, for a 15-week standard semester, I spent three weeks on a Hadoop boot camp. This is like drinking pharma fire hose. You just dump them in the, in the deep end and you just show them everything you need to do, uh, know about Hadoop in, in a couple weeks. Uh, and then the rest of the time was spent on actually working on the project. Okay, and so the resources we used for this iteration of the course were uh, was a, was a cluster from the Academic Cloud Computing Initiative, and uh, and and for the second cluster we actually got a loaner cluster from a research group on campus from the Center for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology. So what happened was one of the uh, students in that group wanted to take my course and uh, had access to clusters as part of the research. So I said, well. Here, this is an alignment of research and education. And since you're going to devote the cluster for the semester to Hadoop, anyways, do you mind if some of the other students use it for their for the course projects? And they they willingly obliged. And and so, uh, so I think this is a very nice case when once you bring research and education uh, into alignment, you can get better utilization of resources. Okay, uh, so there were six teams in the spring 2008 iteration. These are the projects they worked on. Uh, it was a relatively small-scale project, uh, 13 students, uh, uh, seven PhDs, three undergrads, three masters, and they came from all uh, many departments on campus, so from the information school, my home department, computer science, uh, linguistics, uh, and even geography. We had uh, a student that showed up from geography department wanting to uh, uh, participate, uh, and it involved uh, many campus labs. So, of course, the labs on campus working on natural language processing, information retrieval, uh, human-computer interaction, computational biology, et cetera. 
All right, so the second iteration, which happened in fall 2008, had a more traditional setup. So uh, whereas before uh, I had a three-week boot camp and uh, spent the rest of the semester on the project, um, had a more traditional setup with lectures, labs, problem sets, et cetera. So I essentially uh, flipped, the, uh, flipped the order around. So there was a three-week final project, and the rest of the time was spent on these lectures and labs and problem sets. Uh, the, the final project in this case uh, could be research focused. I did encourage them to take that route, but uh, you know they were they were okay. I was okay with it if they wanted to play with other things. Um, and the resource I used this this was uh, Amazon Web Services. So uh, through uh, through a grant from AWS, they provided each one of the students with some free EC2 credits, and they used it for their courses. And that actually worked out beautifully. Um, and uh, and, and so uh, for, for the fall 2008 iteration, I had uh, 21 students total. Uh, I designed it as an intro, intro grad student, sort of a master's level, uh, first year PhD level, and or advanced undergrad. So I had, a, I had a students from, uh, from, uh, from PhD masters and undergrad also. Okay, so what am I going to do now is spend the next few minutes presenting some case studies of, uh, of, of some research that actually came out of, uh, uh, for the most part, since the first iteration in spring 2008 was more research focused. These are, uh, these are the projects that came out of it. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, the problem of pairwise similarity comparison. Uh, the student is uh, Tamara Elsiet, and he's actually, uh, he's actually uh, um, finishing up his dissertation uh, in, a, in a month. So this is, I think, a, a success story for the Academic Cloud Computing Initiative. Uh, he's a PhD student in computer science. Okay, so the problem is this uh, pairwise document similarity problem. So you have a bunch of documents. Uh, you want to represent them uh, as feature vectors, bag of, convert them into bag of words, convert them then into a weighted feature vector, and you want to... Uh, and then you want to compute uh, pairwise document similarity. Right? So you want to uh, compare every document with every other document. Okay, so why would you want to do that? A couple reasons. So you might want to do it for clustering, as, as an initial step for clustering. Uh, you might want to do it for cross-document co-reference resolution, which is actually the application that the student was examining. So you want to see if this mention of Clinton in this document is the same as this mention of Clinton in another document, because the reference might be ambiguous. Well, what you do there is you can convert the, uh, compare the context in which those uh, uh, those uh, references appear in, and so that's a pairwise similarity problem. Uh, when you're doing more like that queries, you can uh, treat this as a pairwise similarity comparison, pre-store the results, and, uh, and, and stir the, uh, serve them up uh, uh, online. Okay, so uh, we looked at uh, similarity functions of this form, so inner products between uh, inner products between uh, weighted feature vectors, and so in actuality, you can replace it with the second form here. So um, the the difference being um, uh, a, a feature will only contribute to a final similarity comparison if it has no non-zero values in in both feature vectors, right? So you can replace it with an intersection. Okay, so we came up with a with what we think is a cute uh, two-step solution in MapReduce. One is building the invert index first, and second is directly computing the pairwise similarity from the, uh, from the postings. Okay, so building the invert index is very standard. So uh, for this toy example, we have three documents, a triangle document, the uh, circle document, and the square document. You, you emit your postings, very standard, uh, sh doing sorting and shuffling, and you gather up the postings list to, uh, to, to create the invert index. Okay, so then you do, then you, uh, then you take the inverted index and you map over it, and what you do here is you essentially cross each postings with itself. You uh, generate the cross product between uh, all, all, all postings in that postings list. And what this does is it generates all the uh, pairs in which that feature will contribute. Okay, so you're, uh, you're computing the, the partial uh, feature combinations. There's the uh, grouping and shuffling process. And then once you group the features together, you can sum and uh, sum them, and you, get the, uh, and you get the final similarity comparison scores. Uh, so this breaks down nicely into a map phase on the one end and a reduced phase on the other end. So, um, and, and so, in actual, so what you're doing here is essentially uh, generating all the feature value pairs uh, in, this, uh, in this when you're crossing the postings. And uh, what MapReduce uh, is doing for you is essentially bringing, uh, bring together the summation, bring together all the partial, partial feature combinations that you need, uh, and in the reduced phase, you just sum across all of them. All right. Uh, and so the idea here is that you, 
uh, map over the postings just once and so uh, and let MapReduce keep track of where all these partial feature uh, weights need to go. Um, so we also implemented with a inf uh, effectiveness efficiency trade-off by what we call DF limiting. So um, there's a Ziffian distribution of terms. Um, what happens is a long time, um, a lot of the times you're comparing the in one document with the in the other document. Right, and that the feature weights gonna, are, are going to be very small in that case. So what you can do is you can essentially throw it away. So you can establish a, a, a document frequency limit and say, okay, if a fur occurs too frequently, we'll just throw it away. Uh, and this actually has a large effect because uh, these term distributions follow, um, follow, follow, follow Ziffian curves, and so you can save a lot of effort that way. Um, so the student wrote a uh, paper that was published as a short paper in ACL 2008 last year, and... Uh, uh, I did some follow-up work that's going to be presented at SIG-IR uh, this year. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the second case study. Um, uh, it's quite interesting. I had a student from the uh, uh, computational biology uh, lab on campus coming here and wanting to explore applications of sequence alignment in the clouds. And actually, there were two of them. Uh, one participated in the spring 2008 iteration and one uh, uh, participated in the fall uh, 2008 iteration. So uh, Mike Schatz and Bing. Ben Lingamid. Um, okay, so I, I think it's easiest to um, uh, to explain this application uh, by analogy, and uh, I do this completely tongue in cheek, as you see in a bit. The analogy breaks down very, very quickly. Okay, so let's say we have Shakespeare, and uh, here we have the, so the famous soliloquy from uh, from Hamlet. Okay, let's say for whatever reason, uh, instead of composing uh, the, the play on normal paper, Shakespeare wrote it on a single very long strand of tape, right? So it's just the entire, the entire play is just one line, okay? And let's say, you know, he was worried about backup, and so, you know, he created multiple copies. You know, never mind that photocopiers didn't exist. That sort of breaks the story, but okay. So, so Shakespeare was uh, carrying around all these, um, uh, all these different copies of the manuscript, and, um, and uh, uh, he tripped, and uh, there was, happened to be a shredder next, next door uh, nearby, and all the manuscript fell into the shredder. Okay. Oops. Okay. So now he has to put everything back together again. Okay. Well, how would you do that? Well, you sort of like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, right? You know, you, you, you take this part, and then, okay, this goes here. Okay, well, well, this must go here because they line up that way, and okay, you know, this part must then follow here, and so on and so forth, and oh, that's, that's a duplicate, so, you know, they must be coming from multiple copies, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you get the idea, right? This is essentially uh, the problem of uh, a, a DNA sequence assembly uh, uh, today, except instead of doing it with words, we're doing it with A, T, C, and Gs, the basic alphabet of, uh, of DNA. Okay, so what happens today is you start off with a, a subject genome, so this comes from a cheek swab, uh, drop of blood, whatever. Um, this is what you're trying to sequence. This is what you're trying to find out. So what you do is you, uh, you prep the sample and you run it through the sequencing machines. So here are just uh, examples from three different, uh, three different uh, 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 manu manufacturers of them. And out on the end, uh, due to limitations of present day technology, you get back a whole bunch of very, very, very short sequences. Okay? which then you have to put together again. These short sequences are on the order of tens of, uh, tens of base pairs. Okay, so you have this problem now, uh, you, you, you had it, and these are called reads, so you have to take the reads and put them back together again. Tens Sorry? Uh, on the order of billions of sequences. Right, so you, you, you prep the sample, run it through the sequencing machine, you get back several gigabytes worth of uh, uh, per, per experiment, and you know these experiments are happening 24/7 on dozens of machines in large uh, genome sequencing centers. Okay, so you have to put you have to put uh, you have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, um, uh, as, as it turns out, it's already been done once. Right? It's been done once as part of the Human Genome Project, uh, and the results of which were published in 2003. Um, so your tax dollars at work. This is done with present, uh, with a previous generation technology. It took uh, 11 years and cost $3 billion. Okay, but now we essentially have a reference sequence. This serves as a scaffolding for us to put the rest of these reads together. All right, so we have the reads, and uh, we basically want to 
uh, put it together, and then we can uh, do this alignment process, and then we can read out the target genome. But of course, it's not going to match exactly. It's not going to match exactly because if it did, there would be no point to doing sequencing. And but the main, the, the bigger point is that all of our DNA sequences are different, right? I mean, we're, we have we share mostly the same DNA, but there are some differences. So there are differences in terms of insertions. Uh, there are differences in terms of deletions. There are uh, differences in terms of mutations. And from a biological point of view, these may be significant, right? So there are genetic diseases that can be traced to uh, insertions, deletions, mutations, et cetera. Okay. Um, okay, so how, how do you do this? How will we solve this uh, problem in uh, MapReduce? Uh, as it turns out, um, uh, one of the students that participated in the course, Michael Schatz, came, uh, put together an algorithm. Uh, he called it Cloudburst. Okay, so the idea is relatively simple. So you start off with the reference genome, and you start off with all the reads, and in the map phase, what you can essentially do is do a sliding window over it and uh, emit what he calls k-mers. But in the natural language processing world, these would be essentially n-grams. Okay, so you, you essentially slide over it and emit all lots of n-grams as, uh, as key value pairs. Uh, in the sort of sorting and shuffling stage, um, this is essentially a, a poor man's version of a large-scale distributed hash map, right? In, in, the, in the shuffling stage, you have the uh, subsequences from the reference genome and the query sequences being brought together. And basically, in the reduced stage, you can, uh, from these alignments, extend them, uh, computing mismatches uh, into account for the insertions, deletions, et cetera, that I talked about in the previous slide, right? Okay, and then, then you can, and once you have the alignments, you just sort of read them off n by n, uh, and end to n, and, and get, out the, uh, get out the alignment. Okay, so this is a rough sketch of the algorithm. There are some general details of, you know, keeping track of where everything came from. Okay, but I think this conveys the idea fairly well. Okay, so here's some, uh, here's some performance evaluation. Uh, on the top, you have a running time for uh, human chromosome 1, and on the bottom, human chromosome 22. So this was run on a relatively small cluster, a 24-core uh, in-house cluster. Uh, the different uh, lines represent how many mismatches you allow. Okay, so the more mismatches you allow, the looser your, your matching scheme, and therefore the longer it takes to compute the possible alignment. So the nice thing uh, that that we see here is that we get linear speed up as their number of our, uh, reads goes up, which is nice. This is exactly the result that we're expecting, and it's a nicely, uh, it's a nice result. All right, uh, and so this was just recently published, uh, and it's coming out to press in, uh, in bioinformatics uh, journal. All right, um, there's also a third case study uh, that I won't go into, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about statistical machine translation. And uh, Chris Dyer was a PhD student in linguistics that, um, that participated in this. And uh, he actually spent the summer as an intern in Google Research last summer. So, uh, so some of you might already be familiar with this work. Um, if you're interested, I'll be happy to discuss this offline uh, in more detail. OK. OK. So I want to spend the sort of the final talk about, uh, the final part of my talk sort of reflecting about, you know, what, what, what does this all mean? So um, I, I think the, the importance of this harkens back to um, basically what we learn in Computer Science 101. Okay, so, uh, you know, cloud computing is full of, is, it's a buzzword, right? So, so what, what is it when you get down to the core? So here's what I did. Um, here are notes from the first computer science course I've ever taken. So you can even see the, the, the date up in uh, the upper right-hand corner, 6001 at MIT. Uh, and so this is, you know, imagine me as a you know, young freshman you know, going up. And this, is, so, uh, and this is basically what I learned in the first 15 minutes of class. And you, you'll see down here, um, this is Gerald Sussman, uh, Jerry Sussman lecturing. He's telling us you know, what, is, what is computation about, what's complexity control. Well, computation is about means of combination and means of abstraction. And there, that's it. I think, I, I think this is really what it's all about. It's all about appropriate levels of abstraction for this, uh, for this changing world of computing. So here's the problem. I think this is the problem. The von Neumann machine, right? So this is a standard architecture that I'm sure we've encountered uh, in, our own, uh, in our own undergraduate days, right? This is the model that's been the standard model for 40, 50 years. This is the model that's been ingrained into our heads. Uh, and when we're uh, developing systems, this is the underlying abstraction that we have in mind. Right. So here, so the, so the problem becomes, okay, now we 
have live in a data which world that we need to think about, not only individual machines, but entire clusters. Okay, so what, what have we done? We've essentially taken each individual abstraction and, and cloned it multiple times. Okay, so, so we're still thinking at, at the cluster level, but we're still, think, still thinking at the individual detailed abstraction level. Okay, and I'm arguing that this is, this is a wrong this is a wrong level. Right? So this is what gets us into issues like this. It's a real live example of deadlock. Is is trying to think at a, 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 a cluster level and trying to worry about the individual machine level at the same time. Right? So what we need is, uh, and what really cloud computing to me is all about, is about the appropriate level of abstraction. So I'll give you some examples of what I think are really nice levels of abstraction. Right? We need abstractions at the level of data centers. Right? This is a blueprint from, from your uh, from your Oregon data center. Uh, we need uh, so that that's the right level of abstraction. Entire data centers. Uh, here's some nice level of abstraction that have that are that are worthwhile. So moving from a traditional stack to a to a uh, virtualized stack. Right. Uh, other examples like Amazon Web Services. Right. So abstracting away the operation and maintenance of uh, of uh, of of, uh, uh, of machines and basically being able to say, okay, give me uh, give me ten Linux boxes, give me a thousand Linux boxes, okay. Google App Engine, right? Uh, scalable API in which uh, people can then develop on top of. And in, at the highest level, the the uh, idea behind Salesforce, right? Uh, apps on demand and service in the clouds, right? Uh, application in the clouds. Okay, uh, and, and so so here, here's I think where we're moving to in the future. I think we're sort of moving into the world where we're going to have applications driving from the top and uh, and continue advances in both uh, information retrieval, natural language processing, um, machine learning, etc. And we're going to have continue advances in in on the on the bottom layer, on the system layer, in terms of architecture, networks, etc. But what's going to be important is the mediating level of uh, of programming uh, and meeting la mediating layer programming models, right? MapReduce is a start, but you know what's next? There surely are, are going to be new appropriate models that follow MapReduce, and so there's going to be uh, both downward force, right? So new applications uh, create new demands uh, for programming models that drive demands on hardware, and there's also going to be upward pressure, right? So uh, advances in uh, in in hardware drive new programming models that draw, that enable new applications. Okay. So uh so uh yeah. So oh so I I want to uh, I want to conclude with this final thought. Right? The the theme of this uh this talk has been, you know, how does the rest of the world get there, right? Um and so you might be wondering, well, you know, I'm at Google. I have all the access to all the computing resources I need. What do I care about the rest of the world? Right? And and I think I think this is this is the important reason. This is an important response. It's sort of the principle of you know the rising tide lifts all boats. Right. So uh, what's good for the community in general will in the end be good for Google. Right. I'd like to thank you for your time, uh, and I'll be happy to take comments. And of course, I have to acknowledge my uh, sponsors for this research. Okay. I, I believe you want to ask a question. I think you're supposed to approach the microphone. So, Jimmy, what 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 are the uh, sort of the you, you give the good side of the story? Are there sort of uh, things kind of frustrating? Like what what are the things to improve? Like in in this kind of like using um, like MapReduce in academic environment. Um, so I don't know if the microphone uh, picked picked that up, but I'll just repeat the question. So Derek Kong's question was, uh, "What about uh, what are the frustrations?" I, I think the primary frustration is just immaturity, right? The immaturity of the uh, the open source equivalents of of all of these technologies we're talking about, right? So Hadoop still has a, a ways to go, but I think we'll eventually get there. So. Um, so the question I have is that, you know, when I'm teaching particularly undergraduates, I mean, mm -hmm. even just getting them to understand how to use a debugger and understand relatively simple mm -hmm. concurrency mm -hmm. is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder that, you know, with something like Hadoop, that, it, you know, what's your experience with how hard it is for students to actually understand it, and particularly when things don't go right and there's either a correctness error or a performance bug in Hadoop code, uh -huh. how well do students do in terms of 
being able to diagnose and understand those problems. Okay. Um, with respect to the, the the particular population you're talking about, intro undergrads, I actually don't have any experience. Um, the students that took my course were all upper-level uh, computer science undergrads, and to some extent they were self-selecting. So they're self-selecting because they are they're interested in it and they want to know about it. So they're I, I think they're much more highly motivated. Uh, so I don't have a good sense uh, for, for that. Well, how about for those students? What was their experience with? Um, I, I think it was understand. a it was, it was a lot of frustration, at, at least in the uh, uh, in the beginning. And the frustration both stems from the the immaturity of the platform. There, you know, certain things like they just spend a lot of time doing more configuration than they should. Um, uh, system level configuration. You know, uh, for example, in the EC2, uh, in the in the in the in the the course that was taught using EC2, I think they spent a lot of time uh, mucking with config scripts, booting up EC2 instances than than they should have. Um, so that's all folded into the actual learning about concurrency. So it's a lot of hard, a lot a, a lot more difficult to tangle than one would, might expect. But um, yeah, I think that's an issue that we need to think about in more detail. Uh, so, sorry, I can't give you a more detailed answer than that, but yes, it's an important problem. Could you comment on uh, the difference between CPU and I.O. utilization? Because uh, oftentimes I found in academic environments, mm -hmm. disk I.O. and network I.O. were really not sufficient and tended to keep you from being able to use the CPUs at their full potential. Um, so we actually don't have a lot of experience with that, um, and I, that actually might be a good thing. So um, when you're working, when we're working with EC2, we basically have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and to some extent, that was the experience with uh, with using the ACCI cluster because it was managed on on our behalf. So we don't actually have um, we don't actually have enough information to be able to. Um, understand the trade-offs between I/O and, and and bandwidth and and CPU cycles, but um, in general, yeah, and in general, I think uh, I, I think everything went quite well, and the resources were more than adequate for uh, for what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, uh, congratulations on your success on this. Sounds like you you really did well. Huh. Thank um, you. Let me ask you a question, like five years from now or 10 years from now, what model do you think best fits sort of the academic environment for this kind of uh, usage? Would it be, is, is the Amazon model the right one, the app engine, or should this be part of some kind of Salesforce thing where you just load it into a big spread, you know, spreadsheet and just work on it? And what, what, would, you, what would you want to have happen? Or what, what is your prediction of where, where it should go? Um... I don't know. Um, I, I think this is uh, part of my uh, part of the reason for my visit here is to um, is to tell you guys on about these things that I've been up to and sort of hoping to engage in a dialogue, you know, plotting, uh, plotting um, and planning for the future. But I, I think they both have their <clears throat> um, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. So I might actually answer your question by talking a little bit about uh, both of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the uh, cluster model. Uh, where we're using the ACCI cluster. I mean, other other uh, other people that have taught the courses have uh, uh, have uh, observed the same thing: is that cluster usage is not even. Right? So, for the most time, for the most part, there is no usage until the night before the problem set is due. Right? And then, then everybody clobbers each other. Right? Okay. So, uh, and, and that that's exactly what the EC2 model solves because everybody gets to play in their own virtual cluster. Okay, so, so, so that's, that would be for the, uh, that would be uh, a win, win for the EC2 model. However, there's always something to be said of uh, uh, having a cluster that's up all the time that you have, have access to. So in terms of convenience, having the AACCI cluster is much more convenient because with Amazon you have to do a lot of Data copying back and forth from uh, from uh, from S3 onto the HDFS. There is a, a cost associated with booting up the instances, shutting them down, um, um, messing with config scripts if things don't work out uh, correctly. Uh, and a lot of these issues will work themselves out in time. You know, so Amazon has new services that allow you to run MapReduce directly. Um, 
Uh, so, so I, I don't know. So both, I, I, I can see merits in both models. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been some migration of things that we would consider traditional HPC high-performance computing tasks onto the Hadoop world. So I understand there's uh, there are, um, uh, components of uh, physics and astronomy experiments um, that have moved into this whole uh, this Hadoop model of computing, and I think it's worked out quite well. Um, uh, I, I think another issue is the traditional HPC world already has a already has a way of doing things right I mean so there's always going to be I mean and it works I mean and so there's always going to be some inertia uh, in, in dealing with those issues right and then there's always um, you know some people find this debatable you know what is it really data intensive I mean we're, we're, we want to say that Hadoop is good for data intensive processing but you know a lot of traditional HPC tasks are data intensive also. Right, so um, it, it, it's unclear at this point, I would say. Yeah. That's exactly the point I wanted to address, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we've got MapReduce, and now it seems like it's a hammer, and every nail starts looking like a MapReduce problem. But that often creates very convoluted codes mm -hmm. that would be much more straightforward. What alternative worker mm -hmm. models are applicable to the, um, the sort of HPC, cl uh -huh. classic HPC style calculations that normally uh -huh. are being run on these big MPI supercomputers with mm -hmm. very low latency. Uh, you know, where I, I've found that often it's easier to just have no communication between the nodes and, mm -hmm. and run it in embarrassingly parallel, but not mm -hmm. in MapReduce. Mm -hmm. uh, I, is there something better than MapReduce we should be thinking about? Uh, yes, I, I, and, and I think this is where I was trying to get to with this slide, is that, um, you know, MapReduce is the first of these abstractions that allow, it's a very convenient one, and it's, it's basically the only one that we have that works at the scale right now. But sandwiched between system level developments and uh, drivers from applications, there will be, there, there, will be uh, there will be new programming models that emerge. I'll give you some examples. So I think uh, at, uh, at Sigmod uh, last year, there was a, uh, a proposal to modify MapReduce into something called MapReduce Merge, where they added a third phase in the end, uh, and that gave you some additional power. Um, there is, uh, and, and I can name a couple more, and none sort of escapes me at this point, of, of other people that have been playing with similar uh, abstractions at that scale. And I, and I think this is, this, is, uh, this is where the innovation is going to come from, and this is where... Um, uh, where with the academic, uh, academic cloud computing initiative and NSF, uh, NSF's efforts as part of the Clue, uh, Clue exploratory, uh, cluster exploratory program is trying to push the field. Um, and uh, you know, I guess a natural question is, uh, you know, where, where would Google be in, in, the, in the picture, right? So that's a question to you guys. Uh, where, where, do you, uh, where do you see future collaborations along these lines between academia and industry. Um, so I, I think this is something that NSF is trying to work out right now. So the, the previous model is that um, as part of uh, the grant to NSF, um, you would request uh, resources through IBM and Google as part of uh, as part of the um, uh, as part of the program, um, and I understand um, Amazon is thinking of doing something similar. So they just recently announced uh, a whole educational thrust along these lines, also where they're uh, soliciting grants to to uh, for EC2 credits. So those are those are just two currently existing models. But uh, I'm sure they'll will come up with something, or NSF will come up with something uh, in the in the future that that uh, that lowers the bar even more, right? Okay, all right. Thank you very much for coming.